Dr. Zulfikar Bhutta is the president-elect of the International Pediatric Association and the co-director of research at the Center for Global Child Health. He joins us now remotely from New York City to discuss his research and the various ways in which the health of children and adults are impacted by the climate crisis. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Bhutta. Among your many accomplishments, you had a large research team in Pakistan working on global issues of maternal, newborn, child survival, and nutrition. What are the major health challenges facing mothers and children in Pakistan as it relates to climate? Well, there are diverse impacts of climate change uh, in Pakistan that we are acutely aware of. One of those is quite evident by the apparent water shortage and drought conditions in many parts of the country, which directly impact nutritional status of women and children. So we believe that there is not only internal displacement and migration of population because water supplies in many areas have dried up. In one of the southern provincial districts of Tharparkar, people just are completely food insecure and malnutrition rates are sky high. At the same time, there is a visible impact in terms of air pollution in many areas because of the impact on the environment of climate change and deforestation. So we know that in certain cities now, the air quality is amongst the worst in, in the region, and that has a direct impact on the health and well-being of not only children, but mothers and adults. And finally, deforestation also increases the risk and propensity for disasters mm -hmm. in many parts of the, of the country. Certainly, in the northern areas where a lot of the glaciers uh, are, deforestation compounds the risk of flooding. And as some of you may recall, in 2010, Pakistan had the disastrous floods which displaced close to around 40 million people from the flood plains. So the impacts of climate change on the lives and well-being of women and children and families in Pakistan is real. And the worrying thing is that it's on a time scale which is faster than people projected and imagined. You've outlined various ways that health is affected by change in climate in both for bo uh, both adults and children. How can we expect those impacts to be exacerbated if nothing is done about climate change? Well, there are three major ways in which climate change impacts on the health and well-being of populations, and particularly children. And you have to remember that children bear a disproportionate burden of the health impacts of climate change. First, because of exposure and risks, and secondly, because of greater physiological vulnerability. So some people even estimate that close to around three quarters to about 80, 85, 86 percent of the entire burden of health impacts due to climate change fall on children. So the way to mitigate that is through both short-term, medium-term, and long-term strategies. And if we don't do something about it, the impact will be real. I mean, it's estimated that infant mortality rates can go up by approximately a quarter due to the impacts of climate change through both these direct and indirect impacts that I've spoken about. And in net terms, models estimate that close to around 80,000 to 150,000 extra deaths can occur because of the unmitigated effect of climate change. So what can the global community do about this? I mean, in my position as the president of the International Pediatric Association, our major role is increasing awareness, is advocacy to our our members, to our member societies, to civic society at large, that this is indeed preventable, that we have, we hold the strings of solutions to the global impact of climate change in our hand, whether it is through putting pressure on governments to put eco-friendly policies in place, develop alternative sources of energies, reduce deforestation, increase the conservation of natural resources like water, all of those things are important to mitigate some of the unimaginable consequences of climate change. And in my part of the world where I come from, in areas like Pakistan, that also means controlling rampant population growth, which mm. also has an impact on resources and its vicious spiral of impacting the consequences of climate change. Of course, natural disasters also play a role in the health and well-being of people. Uh, why should pediatricians specifically be concerned about natural disaster reduction? Well, clearly because the people who pay the price for those natural disasters are largely children and women 
who are the most vulnerable in, in any population. It's been estimated that of the people who are displaced because of some consequences of climate change, notably drought and food insecurity, over half are children. Uh, we, we saw that very clearly, as I just briefly mentioned to you, in the 2010 floods in Pakistan, roughly about a third of the most vulnerable people at risk of the consequences of being displaced from the floodplains were children. High, unimaginable rates of malnutrition were noted in some of those populations. So we ought to be concerned about the consequences of disasters, particularly for those who are at greatest risk. And these disasters are frequently unpredictable. So uh, things like fires in California. You can well imagine if there was an equivalent of this in other parts of the world which do not have the financial resources, we do not have the depth in terms of firefighting services that the United States has, this could really lead to massive loss of life. And, and of course, as I've mentioned briefly, you've seen the example of deforestation impacting on large mudslides in many parts of the world which have led to major loss of life, many of those being women and children. Indonesia, for example, has seen a series of its own natural disasters, floods, earthquakes, tsunami, volcanic eruption. Some are climate related, some not. But how do these events highlight the world we live in now? And what do we need to do to mitigate the effects of mortality in these areas prone to natural disaster? So there are measures, as I've alluded to, which are number one, to promote resilience in the populations at risk. Secondly, clearly, populations and people at risk of some of the consequences of climate change and flood risk really need to be relocated to safer environments. Third, governments, and Indonesia is a, is a remarkable example, need to put policies in place that they can implement, that some of the root causes of the, of the environmental disaster and change that they're experiencing can be reduced and stopped. Indonesia, for example, is not only affected by by massive burning of forests, leading to environmental climate change, deforestation, and consequences within its own environment, but also is a source of major air pollution in the neighborhood, in the ASEAN region. Mm -hmm. So these are things that need to be put together in terms of a strategy for mitigation, for increasing resilience of the populations and preventive issues, as well as, as, as I mentioned at the outset, for the world to really implement what we all got together in the Paris Climate Accord to put policies in place that not only impact the generation that we have today, but our future generations. We only have one planet. And if we don't make those investments today, as pediatricians, as parents, as family members, our forthcoming generations will never forgive us. How are innovations in the private sector working to combat the climate crisis in Pakistan? Well, that's a challenging question because the private sector in Pakistan is very small compared to many well-endowed countries. But still, you are beginning to see some really innovative and thoughtful investments by the private sector. Investment, investments in solar and wind energy is an example. Uh, a lot of those are coming in through the private sector as alternative strategies for reducing the dependency on fossil fuels and coal burning. Second are really innovative water conservation mechanisms that are coming through the private sector. But perhaps the most remarkable is the beginning of a public-private partnership in Pakistan, whereby the current government has announced a policy of planting 10 billion trees within the next one year or so. Wow. And that is the first time that a government has focused its attention on the root causes of many of the issues that people have, which then has a vicious spiral and cycle of not only ecological change and disaster, but also reducing the impact of some of these investments uh, in the long term on creating employment opportunities and other economic growth of populations in areas where they could very well have tourist attractions. They could very well have other, other things, including uh, local industries if they did not have unmitigated and unaddressed deforestation. 
You just mentioned one of the things that the government is doing to take more of a role in helping combat the climate crisis. Uh, we know that they're also providing health services. Can you tell us some more specific things and some specific steps that they're taking right now? So uh, one big consequence of climate change in the short term uh, with water insecurity is the impact that it has on the health of young children. If you are water insecure, you can well imagine the risk and consequences of diarrheal disorders go up quite considerably. Your ability to promote water sanitation hygiene in many of the areas, rural areas in particular, is also reduced somewhat. So the government is focusing its attention on as I had mentioned earlier, water conservation, as well as increasing awareness of looking at ways and means of irrigation, which are also uh, eco-friendly and reduce the, uh, the losses. The third is a massive uh, national drive led, interestingly, by the, the Chief Justice, who's the, who's, mm. uh, who's the highest judicial officer in, in, in Pakistan, on creating the awareness around water storage systems to mitigate the impact of the forthcoming water crisis. Mm. The fourth is increasing awareness around the need for long-term solutions. As you know, Pakistan and India have a long-term agreement on sharing water resources because most of the, uh, the headworks of water that comes into Pakistan, into the rivers, lie in India. And many people are concerned that as water resources shrink, there could very well be elements of insecurity in the region because of the fight over water resources, something that we have seen mm. underlie many of the conflicts that have emerged in other parts of the world, such as Africa and the Middle East. So there is increasing attention by the civic society and the government on the need to find a peaceful solution and as well as engagement around water conservation, reforestation, engagement of civic society in understanding the need for us to be more eco-aware. How can pediatricians play a role in advocacy? What, why is it important for them to understand that they should be part of the conversations to reduce disaster risk? Well, because we are front and center uh, as important players in this, we look after children, we look after families, and we can clearly see our role as guardians of not only the current generation, but the forthcoming, the next generation. So pediatricians not only see the consequences of some of the impact of uh, climate change, whether it's excessive diarrhea, whether it is <clears throat> malnutrition rates in children, whether it is population displacement because of conflict and impact of climate change in some areas, we see that all the time. And we also know, as I mentioned to you earlier on, that a disproportionate burden of climate change falls on children. So our role in that is not only to be palliative, is to provide some support when it is needed for children affected by this, but also be proactive as advocates with policymakers, with families, to be in the front line of the debate with politicians in terms of how important this is to address in the long term, to make sure that strategies and actions are evidence-based. One of the big challenges that we have in the world today is how to make sure that people realize that climate change has a science behind it in terms of recognizing the consequences as well as the risk factors for climate change. So unless pediatricians are part of the solution, part of the debate, we just cannot be voyeuristic on this and being sitting on the fence and observing everything slide. So I see myself as the president of the International Pediatric Association representing pediatricians in over 160 countries and many regional pediatric societies as being in the forefront of the debate on addressing this issue, on increasing awareness with families, with our members, and also being part of the solution. Thank you for joining us on 24 Hours of Reality, Dr. Buddha. We really appreciate it.